Hi, you know, it's really an interesting year because of the virus and the disruption that it's caused the campus and our community. So it's, it's kind of sad that we're not able to gather together for breakfast live and in person like we did last year, which was a fabulous opportunity. But um, at least we get to talk today and we get to share a few things as we always do about how things are going here at the USF St. Petersburg campus. So welcome, good to, good to have you here. In terms of the coronavirus, our students have um, been remarkable. They have done everything that we've asked them to do. They sanitize their areas, they wear their masks, they wash their hands, they keep their distance. And we've had infection rates that are remarkable. You can count on one hand the number of our students who are in residence on this campus that have had to go into quarantine. Um, I'm really proud of our students and they've kept everybody safe and they continue to do that. You know, the, the racial unrest in the community and the marching and the protests, of course, we absolutely understand and have no problem with those peaceful demonstrations. Um, we've always been very attentive to the needs of individuals on this campus. We're an inclusive community. So we've always had the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Diversity and Inclusion on this campus that works with us and advises me on things we need to do on campus to make this the inclusive community we want it to be. They've always been in place, they've always worked with us, we're very happy with what they've been doing. But we also decided that because of the need, we probably should form um, a larger group of individuals that also bridge into the community of St. Petersburg, where we live and work and play. So we put together what we are calling the Campus Community Task Force on Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity. And it's a, a task force of individuals from the community of St. Petersburg from other higher education institutions in Pinellas County and our, and our own individuals from this campus working together to look at identifying what we could do here that might be impact, impactful in the community and supportive of people in the community and what the community is doing that could be very informative and very impactful for our faculty, staff and students on this campus. So we're meeting monthly and we have several initiatives that we are going to be working on that this group of individuals has identified as priorities for us. And we're very excited about some of the things they're planning to do. The Osprey opened in the fall. Right now, they're working on the bottom floor food facility, which will be a remarkable place where students have many more choices in dining than they've had before. It should be completed by January on the bottom floor. Um, the Osprey itself is an incredible facility, and when we're able to bring people in to give them a tour, we want to do that because, to be honest, the top floors, the views out of the top floors of the Osprey are million dollar views. Um, even better than our Dean of the Kate Tiedemann School of Business and Finance upstairs in this building and the million dollar view he has, yeah, these are just as good. So we're really happy with um, that facility and students are very excited about it. I've talked to students who live there and they think it's just a wonderful place to be. So we're really excited that was we were able to open that in the fall. Well, Davis Hall, the largest classroom facility on our campus, as you may know, the entire second floor has been completely gutted and is in the final stage of complete renovation. It'll be much more open, much more light will be coming into it. Uh, it'll be redesigned for the 21st century and it should be completed in November and we will be able to bring back into the second floor all of the faculty offices and student classrooms that we lost during the renovation. So we're excited to be doing the, it might be a virtual ribbon cutting, but at least it'll be a ribbon cutting and a reopening of the top floor of Davis Hall. I'm really pleased with the, our friends who have continued to support this campus despite those unforeseen circumstances that we find ourselves in. Well, Kate Tiedemann School of Business and Finance, um, Kate and Ellen were able to contribute to the college again, this school again, to uh, endow um, a finance professor's position, which solidifies that position in this school. And finance, of course, being part of what this school is really focused on, really solidifies that program well into the future which was just a remarkable thing for them to do. They were able to contribute to the Stay Afloat Fund, 
at USF St. Petersburg campus, which provides assistance to students who have temporary financial difficulties that prevent them from continuing their education. So because of their generosity, we had students who were able to complete their degrees and continue towards a degree that would have otherwise had to stop out because of the virus and the disruption to their lives. This year, um, Dr. Bill Heller, a longtime leader on this campus um, from way back before, before I was a known name here at all, um, passed away. And Heller Hall, of course, is named after Bill and his many contributions to this campus. Um, he was a longtime stalwart of this university setting. He really got us through many changes that had to occur over his time here. When I came, he was the dean um, of the College of Education here on this campus and director of the Bishop Center for Ethical Leadership, which he grew into where they're, where they're able to function now as a USF-wide center for leadership. We had two people, two individuals retire this year who have had significant impacts, not only on this campus, but on their profession. Uh, Dr. Ray Arsenault, um, in history, he is renowned throughout the world for his work and for all of the publications and books and movies from his books, of course, that have come out over time. And Ray has announced that he will be retiring at the end of this fall semester. He's been a strong advocate for this campus. He's been a strong advocate for USF. He's, he's an icon and he is leaving us. Um, also, Dr. Helen Levine, who has been our Regional Vice Chancellor for External Affairs and Governmental Relations. Um, she's been a, an, an outstanding right arm person for me in this position because she understands the lay of the land in Florida. She understands how everything works, how everything is interconnected. And she has been also an, a, a stalwart in promoting the value of this university campus to this community and in helping everyone stay in tune with what we're all about here. We will miss her greatly. Also this year, we were able to welcome a new Dean for the College of Marine Science, Tom Fraser, who is a remarkable individual with a huge background connected at the highest levels of Florida in the, in the world of marine science and marine life. Um, we're very privileged to have him as part of our leadership team at the University of South Florida St. Petersburg campus. He has been a joy to work with. We've had lots of conversations about the future of the marine sciences, sustainability and environmental sciences on this campus and in this community. And he will be a real asset to USF uh, in his new position. We look forward to continuing to work with Tom as things evolve in that programmatic area. The Innovation Scholars Program, you may not know a lot about that. We've tried to keep information in the news about it because nobody else in the state of Florida at the university level offers that kind of program. This is very distinctively USF St. Petersburg campus, and that is a distinctive program here. We started a year ago um, with the idea of every new student fresh out of high school coming here should have an opportunity to get into the field get into an organization that they can receive some mentoring in related maybe to their field that they career they might think they want to do but even if not at least they'll get mentored into what does it mean to be a professional working in that organization so we had 30 i think it was 36 students last year who were fresh out of high school 17 18 year olds paired up with um, individuals in organizations in downtown St. Petersburg. I said it had to be walkable, trolleyable, bikeable, scooterable, anything just skatable, just as long as they can get there without having to have a car. So organizations in St. Pete stepped up to provide uh, an individual to mentor these students and students started to be able to visit on site, spend time with those individuals and see what that professional world was like. We thought, okay, maybe we should extend it uh, an invitation again this year and see what we get. Well, at one time, at one point, over a hundred students <laughs> coming in new this year wanted to participate. Um, because of some changes in those student plans, not coming in residence, we dropped down to about 76 students, but we have over 70 students 
participating, which is double the number we had last year, and over 60 organizations in St. Petersburg providing mentoring opportunities for those students. And now we're looking at moving that Innovation Scholars Program into a second year experience for those students so they continue to be able to understand careers, professional preparation for those careers, resume writing, job interviewing, all of those things that are gonna help lead them towards an internship, and then when they complete their degree, employment in a career in a professional position. We're really excited about where that program's going. In terms of access, as you know, when consolidation happened, the admission criteria changed, and um, we had to raise the bar in terms of traditional freshmen, first year students coming out of high school. Higher GPAs, higher SAT and ACT requirements were put into, into effect. So we knew that that would have um, a little bit of an impact <laughs> for a while on our ability to draw those students in and get them admitted here to this campus. So we worked with St. Pete College where we already had what we call FUSE, which is a two-year seamless transfer program, AA degree to a BS or BA degree with us. We implemented what is called Pinellas Access to Higher Education, PATH, and we just put that into effect a year ago. We have four individuals hired as staff who work in the public schools, in the high schools in Pinellas County, primarily in the St. Pete area, South St. Pete, and they work with the families and students in those schools to help educate them on how to be prepared to go beyond high school, whether it be to St. Pete College or USF or USF St. Petersburg. We don't, we don't specify that. We just help them understand how they get prepared to go where they're wanting to go beyond high school, how to get financial aid, how to go through the application process, how to get ready to matriculate. And right now, I think after one year, we have 76 students at St. Pete College in the PATH program planning to come here as soon as they complete their obligation at St. Pete College. The difference is from FUSE, FUSE has specific majors, 19 majors that are fused together. PATH does not care about the major. It's not about the major. It's about completing these requirements at St. Pete College so you have a seamless transfer here along with a scholarship to support you initially when you come here so that those students can still have that transfer experience be very seamless for them. There's also, um, a, we, we call it a program, but kind of an approach to, <laughs> to help take our students and partner them up with seniors in our community, primarily close to campus and senior communities here that were pretty isolated when the virus um, struck and those senior communities really enforced and had to enforce people staying home and not going out into the community. So we developed what we called Friends of St. Pete, St. Pete Friends, and it was taking students who volunteer to be paired up with a senior citizen in our community who is basically isolated and get them to communicate with one another, get them on a regular schedule of communication, whether it's a phone call, an email, a video conference, chat, whatever technology or non-technology works. It was just to get them paired up. We had students, uh, we didn't start this until last April, uh, and so the semester was pretty short, the time we had left, but we had over 25 students who agreed to participate back in the spring and then got paired up. I know we've had uh, students respond back that it's been an, an eye-opening experience for them, and I hope it's been a remarkable experience, of course, for the seniors, because they learn from college students their perspective on life, and college students learn from the seniors their perspective on life, and there's a bridge created that um, wouldn't have been there if we hadn't said, there's gotta be some way to help ameliorate you know, this sense of loneliness that will come from being isolated. So we're very pleased that that program continues and we hope if there's a need that it'll continue to grow to help address that need in St. Pete. In terms of fundraising and advancement on this campus, we have now for the fifth year in a row exceeded our goal, which is a testament to not only the friends of the university that stepped forward to really invest in us, but also to that team of people that work in advancement and all of the great things that they do. We couldn't do any of this without our friends and without the guidance from those individuals that help us do that because all of our students benefit from that 
that is the most important thing to me is that our students benefit from those external resources that are brought to this campus. So thank you for helping us exceed our goal again. Those are a few things we've been doing for the past year since we met last, but there's still things to share and there's some other individuals that are going to share some of those things with you. And I'm very pleased that they have that opportunity to do that with you and I hope you enjoy the time. This summer, we knew going into it that a lot of our classes were gonna be online or hybrid with a few face-to-face. -face. In a typical year, um, we do about 35, 36% of our classes completely online, but because of COVID, that percentage went up a great deal to about 60% completely online, and then um, about 15% 15, 15 or so hybrid, and then the rest were face-to-face. So we worked a lot with faculty to get their courses transitioned. Um, you know, we didn't, it, it, there was a lot of negative um, talk about online classes, but, a, but a, an online class is not a Skype conversation. It is truly something that's constructed and deliberate with definite outcomes. It's scaffolded for effective learning outcomes. And um, that's what our instructional designers and librarians and people on the people who work on campus that's what they worked on with our faculty to make sure that they had effective online classes well our faculty have been doing been doing incredible work with grants um, in fact this past year we received 20, up 20 million dollars in grants which was a, a major increase over the last year which was about seven million um, faculty have devoted significant time and energy to to um, to promote their research and and um, and further their research. Uh, and one of, we, we have a several different areas where people have stood out. To our faculty member, Sean Duty, who um, does, conducts research in Australia, uh, uh, related to, the, to cane toads as predators. And he's our, a, a fabulous um, faculty member in um, biology. And he's been working down in Australia with um, the goanna lizard and the impacts of the cane toads on the goanna lizards. And so it's just another exciting, you know, our faculty aren't, aren't, don't just have a local reach, they have a global reach. And his, his research is a really strong example of that. And he's received a lot of attention and press for that. And so uh, it's really important that we celebrate faculty members and that kind of work. Another professor I'd like to highlight is Dr. Tiffany Cheneville from Psychology. She is a renowned scholar in the area of HIV research and um, especially with children. She was recently awarded a Fulbright to study, uh, to, to do a research project in Canada. Um, it's another exciting example of our faculty doing international work and being recognized for their expertise and contributions in that area and uh, we look forward to what uh, Dr. Cheneville can, can learn as a result of her research in that area. The You Matter grant that Dr. Lyman Dukes from the College of Education received along with a, uh, with a colleague. This is a grant that provides opportunities at the university for students with disabilities. USF St. Petersburg has a long tradition of working with students with students with disabilities, started by um, Dean Bill Heller, who is a, a wonderful leader on our campus. And it's incredible to see Dr. Dukes um, continuing this emphasis and the kind of equal opportunities we provide to all students. It's, a, it's an incredible grant, it's $900,000. It's substantial, very meaningful. The supportable pantry, I think, wouldn't be able to exist without the support of the community. And particularly, I would say, first faculty, staff, and even students have been making donations to the pantry itself, as well as community members have been asking of me, um, how can I donate, how can I make a difference? And they've been able to even log on with Amazon um, and to be able to facilitate a donation easily. Um, and safely uh, to help keep our, our pantry stocked uh, so that we can provide support for students in need. Our supportable food pantry, it, no doubt it's made a, a profound difference in the lives of students. Uh, just in this last year, and particularly during the pandemic, um, we've provided 2,520 pounds of food in total, uh, served 125 students in total, and provided 200 pounds of pet food um, and so clearly there's, there's been an uptick in need 
Um, and it's, again, continued to make a difference as we move forward into this academic year um, in the lives of students that, that may be in need and may be impacted by the pandemic. So the Wellness Center um, is an integrated, uh, I'll say, health center that provides uh, mental health support. Um, it, provides, it provides a health center for students. It also provides victims advocacy for students as well as prevention education programming. And so students can access all of those services virtually. Uh, since the pandemic began, um, the Wellness Center went about establishing a telehealth program so students can arrange appointments uh, with a physician um, virtually. Um, and then if there's additional needs, then that medical professional would route them to the right resource. Uh, also, there's uh, virtual mental health support available certainly during business hours, 8 to 5, but also from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m., there's also uh, mental health support available via telephone. And so they can call a number that's advertised on the Wellness Center webpage, and then they can access someone uh, should they need support to help bridge them to the next day. And so in the Wellness Center, uh, the feedback that they've been receiving is very positive about the availability of mental health support and medical support, as well as victims advocacy. Uh, being virtual, it's, students are saying it's more convenient and, and even more accessible than it already was. I think the, the virtual environment has made it more easy for students to access. And so that's been a plus for us and a learning for us as we think about uh, our plans for post-pandemic. Uh, how we may incorporate what we've learned so far to, to have services that are even more accessible to them. Osprey Suites is a birth of an idea from our students, our faculty, our staff that incorporates community space and really was driven by this idea of what is it like to live in downtown St. Pete but also engage in the university setting. Right, so our students wanted to feel this very urban sense and this downtown living experience, but also have spaces where they could engage with each other and it feel very homey. Uh, so we balance that urban experience with the comfortableness of the living room. So we go back and forth. We have the campus's first community kitchen, which we're super excited about. Uh, the community kitchen was built with a few different things in mind, not only ADA accessibility, but how do we incorporate nutrition and how do we focus on the student experience, preparing our students for life after college. And notoriously, stereotypically, of course, you hear so many students don't, don't know how to cook when they leave the college experience. Uh, so we have teamed up with our dining provider, Airmark, to help bring some cooking lessons to the students and engage here in the community kitchen, as well as some local, uh, sh some local cooks and chefs from the area that have volunteered to come in and hang out, do some cooking demonstrations. So that's really exciting. In addition to that, we have um, a plethora of community spaces. So we really drove home on this idea of what is it like to build community, to engage with each other. And obviously right now in the middle of a pandemic, it's not ideal to <laughs> engage in some of these spaces. Uh, but up in the halls uh, where the students' rooms are, we have what we call 30-second spaces. So there's spaces built for people to have quick conversations and not engage in the hallway. Thinking about our students that may be handicapped, needing to still use the hallway but not interrupt a conversation. Those students can just scoot into those spaces. We also have a multi-purpose space. So the multi-purpose space was built for, in the future, having classes come to the residence hall and, in, and faculty engaging with our students in the space where they live that's more comfortable. We focus on bringing people together. And when we ran into the pandemic, obviously things shifted drastically. Um, we spent a large portion of the summer focusing on how to bring those students back safely, uh, but also not losing the experience all around. We recognize that our FTICs, our first time in college students that are coming in, lost a good portion of life events. They didn't get to experience prom. They didn't get to experience graduation in the same ways that we did, right? Um, so we really did focus on how can we engage and bring them back in a way that is safe and but also gives them the experience. So move in, we focus really heavily on the in-person move in. So people saw our faces. 
covered by mask and plexiglass. Um, but we also have our mandatory mask mandate inside the building, so students are required as soon as they leave their bedrooms to have their mask on and engaging any of the spaces. We have a ton of hand sanitizer stations around campus, so we are very much encouraging our students to engage in those spaces, as well as environmental testing. And environmental testing is something that you haven't heard a ton about um, in the news, but essentially what we are doing are we having volunteers swipe spaces and surfaces around high traffic areas to see if there is a presence of the virus on those surfaces and in those spaces. And luckily we've been really fortunate to have uh, no cases there. Um, our positivity rate is, I think the last time I checked, 0 .002. Um, so that's really exciting that we have a lot of compliance from our students to engage in ways that are safe. And I know across all three of our buildings and housing, our students say we really want to have that experience of being here on campus. So we're trying to do the right thing. So we have students wearing masks and checking other students that may not be wearing masks and saying, hey, it's a thing. This is a cultural shift for our students to do the right thing so they can experience college life. What we have done is really engage our students in kind of where they are. We have an increase in our social media presence and we're posting more memes and more funny things for our students to engage in, which for us is very different than the kind of in-person programming. We've created our bulls in the cloud for the St. Pete campus. So there's a Canvas page where our students would traditionally go for their academic classes. There is a repository for uh, programming on the Canvas site. So students that want to engage in a synchronous conversation will do it on Teams and then we'll save it and allow it to be placed on the bulls in the cloud for them to engage asynchronously in the same educational experiences. So they say, hey, I can't be there for class, but I still want to talk. I still want to learn. Our RAs have more group meetings and they're having more conversations via email and via Instagram and TikTok and all of the things. I have learned more about TikTok and Reels in the last four months than I think any plus 30 year old probably should. Um, but our RAs are like, hey, that's where our students are. So we're figuring out a way to transform our educational content that would normally be in a program to be on these platforms where our students are already at. So we know our students don't want to sit in front of a screen any longer than they have to. They're doing it for class. They're doing it to talk to parents and connect with family members. So we recognize that screen fatigue. So we say, hey, well, where are you spending time when you're not looking at your computer screen? And it is on the Instagrams, the TikToks, the social media platforms. So we transitioned a good bit of our educational content to short little snippets, one minute, get in, get out memes that directly correlate with wearing a mask or social media, social moments of people wearing masks before the pandemic even started. Having those moments in between our students where they are able to connect with educational material that doesn't look like educational material. Living learning community is a very specific term and here on our campus we broadened it out to a residential community program. And a residential community program is an umbrella term. So our living learning communities, I'm gonna get a little nerdy, um, a living learning community specifically has a class attached to it. So students will go into a classroom, or in our case, into a Teams or a Canvas experience, engage with a professor or some, a faculty member, where there's actual content, there's a curriculum built out in the academic standpoint. They get academic credit for a class and that class lasts for the duration of the year. It can last for a semester or for an entire year. And luckily this year we were able to have the honors uh, college engaging in one of our LLCs. And we also have leadership who is engaging in one of our LLCs. And our LLCs are thriving right now. They're engaging. They're doing a really fantastic job in shifting how we think about it. Cause so we're uh, collaborating honors. We're figuring out different ways to do service and how do we engage in service opportunities in a pandemic. So shifting to think a little bit outside the box and what are things that our students can do in their rooms or away from big groups to engage in things like that. 
Then we have theme communities. Our theme communities, similar to Stonewall Suites or Global House, really focus on an idea. So the idea there, they are not attached to a faculty member. They do have a staff member and a community partner that is engaged with that community, but they do a ton more informal meetings. So they have hangouts, they have teams meetings, where they come in, they learn about a specific topic. We also have first year interest groups. And our first year interest groups uh, our first one here on our campus is biology. Um, biology, so first year students that are interested in biology and want to be around other people that are interested in biology have the opportunity to live together and engage with an RA that is also in biology and a faculty member to come in and kind of oversee things. But there is no class, again, associated with it. So they're exploring what does it mean to be a biology major? Where can they go with a biology degree? What should they do? What classes should they take? Um, and really living around people that have a similar interest with being loosely connected. Uh, I will say all of our, our residential community programs are doing an astounding job at really building the community because they have an idea that they're centered around. So it is a lot easier to engage in a, a little bit more screen time if you're talking about something that you're really passionate about, right? So, they're having the time of their lives from what I understand. Our engagement is up with our residential community programs and in our asynchronous programming as well. We have had a long, rich history of LLCs here on our campus, even from the early days. Uh, we had uh, leadership is one of our older ones, biology. We noticed our students really wanting to focus more on their academics and say, hey, I really need to focus on the classes I need to take for my degree and I don't have a lot of extra classes to take. So we said, okay, well now that we have students that really want to get in and get out in four years, not that they didn't want to do that before, but making sure that we're not adding additional coursework to our students, uh, to our students' accounts, we said, how can we get a similar experience while also acknowledging our students' wants and desires to get, at, get in and get out in four years? And that is where the theme community really grew from. We also had some really strong community partners, Metro Inclusive Wellness, uh, the, Urban De the Office of Urban Development and Mayor Kreisman's office really come in and say, hey, we really want to engage with our students. How do we do that? And it was a perfect marriage of, okay, well, we have community members and, and offices across campus that want to engage with our students. We also need to create something for students outside the classroom that's not going to add to their credits overall. Why don't we build something similar to the LLC experience? And that's where our theme communities and FIGS really grew from. And our students came to us, and sometimes they come to us with it. So our students uh, proposed an idea for King Suite, and King Suite is a community that's under development this year that was proposed by a student. They say, hey, we really want to have this experience and what is it like to explore the African-American diaspora in our current context in St. Pete across the country? What does that look like? So we were able to team up with some really fantastic people across the community, Office of Multicultural Affairs, to build what does a curriculum look like with this student's idea. We work with the students very hands-on and say, okay, what do you want to learn? And they say, hey, we want to explore X, Y, and Z. Then we teach them, what is a learning objective? And we build the curriculum out step-by-step step with the students, with our community partners. And we're excited that community is going to launch next year. And it is completely student-driven, which is for us the, the paramount uh, for <laughs> this type of experience, that our students are so engaged in this, ex this process that they want to build one themselves. We've found that it's actually been really beneficial for students who work, work off campus, who might have family obligations and other things that they can get resources in a more accessible way. Um, and they can also connect from home without needing to make the trip to campus to go to an event or something like that. So there have been some really wonderful benefits of this shift that we that we couldn't have expected. Um, so the, the network is something that is offered through the Compass office and it's a series of interest groups that students can connect with other students who have 
similar passions or hobbies. Um, and those are hosted by our peer coaches. So it's a great way for students to meet meet student leaders, but also meet their peers, especially for the first year students who may have even never been to campus before. So right at the start of everyone working from home, learning from home, we were really scrambling to try to figure out how to help students stay connected. So we came up with the idea of doing a pen pal program, um, just to, to have a way to meet someone who students may not have met otherwise. And then we opened it up to students all around the country, all around the world, and got a much bigger response than we were ever anticipating. Um, so to date we have over 1,600 signups from over 200 institutions, a lot of which come from um, USF, the St. Pete campus, and Tampa and Sarasota campuses as well, um, but also from institutions all around the world. So as far away as Germany and South Africa, Hawaii, um, and it's been really amazing to see the student response of wanting that, that point of connection um, that never would have happened given different circumstances. Some of the asynchronous programs that we have been doing include, um, we did a how to, how to College COVID edition series on our Instagram page, and we had staff members and student leaders sharing tips on, on resources, on how to get connected, all of those things um, in short videos throughout the day. And those are saved on a story highlight, so now students can go back and refer to them whenever they want. Um, we also did a get outside challenge. So rather than having students log on, we wanted to encourage them to get outside and explore St. Pete. So we had, um, we had staff and student leaders share their favorite places in St. Pete. Um, and we shared some fun photos on our social media and then linked to the location so students could hopefully go out and explore and find those places on their own. They are resilient, they are adapting. Um, it's it's hard and it's different from what they expected. I think especially our first year students are navigating a whole new world, um, a lot of them still from home. Um, so they're, they're trying to adapt and, um, and really doing a good job of branching out and going outside of their comfort zone. Um, so coming to virtual events where they, you know, they've never met anybody who's in that virtual room with them before, um, meeting with their peer coaches, going to classes online. Um, you know, a lot of them have not had to had to learn online before, so um, doing what they need to to be successful in this environment. Um, I think we've seen a lot of creativity and initiative from our current students to welcome the new students and make sure they still realize they're part of the USF family and that they are still a bull even if they're not here on campus in the classroom. We have also been focusing on transfer students and how to serve them during this time. And I think they've really actually benefited from the flexibility because our transfer students sometimes are older, they might have families, and so they, they really can kind of hop on and get the information they need at a time that's most convenient for them. Um, and they can meet with different staff members and other transfer students on a more flexible schedule. So we're continuing to host transfer connection events where they can be in community with other transfer students, um, but also still giving them a chance to continue on with their lives and balance everything out while being a part of the USF community. The semester has been an interesting one, definitely. I think um, it's important to say that we've all been very resilient and we've all been uh, adapting to the changing circumstances throughout the semester so far. I think it's very important to note that it's been the effort of not only students, but the faculty and the staff that have helped us kind of adapt to the new semester. I think it's very important that we make sure that we're still learning, even though our learning environment has slightly changed. I'll have to say that I've sadly haven't seen my friends as much as I would have any other year, but at the same time, we've utilized technology not only for our classes, but to make sure that we're keeping in contact. They've been great support when it comes to having study sessions after our classes, whether that is through um, any platform online or calling through the phone. So it's important to um, kind of have that support system, whether it is online or through the phone or any other way, and make sure that we remain safe by not having that close in-person contact that we would have any other year. It's been a very difficult semester, I would say, for everyone, really. Um, it's important to note that not only do we have the normal stress of classes, but we have the stress of this global pandemic kind of creating changes around 
uh, our environment as well. I have to say that I've been very concerned with the health of my family and my friends. And that is usually a stress that I don't carry in any other normal school year. But I think the best thing that we can do right now is to make sure that we are following up on our friends and our family and making sure that they have that emotional support that is greatly needed throughout this time. When it comes to my classes, I just want to thank professors. I know it's been a different learning environment, not just for us, but they've had to relearn a lot of what it means to teach students. A lot of them were not used to teaching classes online and the shift has made it very difficult for not only us, but for them to make sure that they carry on the same information that they would in a classroom, but on an online setting. And to them, I just say thank you. I know it's been a difficult process, but I think patience from both sides has helped us succeed. And I think it's very important to mention that um, I just want students to succeed and I feel the same way. So I appreciate anyone that comes up to me and asks me for support and I give it to them. And I think motivating ourselves, whether that is through uh, meetings online and making sure that we're connected is very important because that provides a little bit more of the normal study setting that we would have in any other semester. It's definitely not business as usual, sadly, but when it comes to student government this semester, I have to say that I'm very, very proud of every single student leader here. And we have taken this opportunity to support students. We've done a number of programs, whether that is events that connect with students directly or sharing of resources that are widely available across campus. But we've also made computers available to students that need that resource as well. We understand that for a long time, students did not have access to the resources that they would otherwise have. And it's important to understand that for a big number of students, not only on our campus, but across the country, they depend on university resources to carry on their university work and make sure that they're doing well academically. So in order to not provide that interruption to not only us, but them, it's important to know that we need to share those resources and we need to make those widely available to everyone. To everyone who contributes to our campus community, I have to say that you're such a valued member of it. You're a bull just like I am and just like faculty and staff members are. And it is so important that you remain involved and remain a part of our university. You're such a vital part of it and we appreciate every single effort that you make to ensure that not only are we succeeding academically, but we're succeeding professionally as well. Thank you for watching today. I am extremely humbled to be here today to share some of the things we've been doing with our friends and you're our friends. Uh, we highly value you, your contributions, everything you have done to make USF St. Petersburg the incredible place that we are today. We're very pleased with everything that's going on here. We continue to find ways to make this the kind of place that everyone wants to be, and we thank you for your efforts on our behalf. So thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed what you were able to see, and I encourage you to get in touch with me at any time. I'll give you a call, send me a text message. We'll get in touch. Thank you very much, and go Bulls.